The greatest voyage in human history is coming to an end very soon. As people, we are infected by a natural compulsion to explore the unknown. Whether it's climbing a mountain, crossing a desert, or sailing the ocean, our entire history has been defined by journeys into the unknown. The only question that remains unanswerable is just how far can we actually go? I can't answer that, but I can tell you about the furthest that we have ever gone and what we found 24 billion kilometers away from our tiny home on a pale blue dot. This is the story of the Voyagers. In October 2023, NASA engineers transmitted a signal to interstellar space aimed at a point beyond the influence of our sun, four times further away from our planet than the icy surface of Pluto. NASA delivered a software update to an aging machine named Voyager 2. After 46 years spent hurtling through deep space, the life of this probe is hanging on by a thread. But scientists refuse to give up. A new round of computer code is aimed at maintaining the fragile connection between the Earth and the unknown. If the update is successful on Voyager 2, then the same signal will be dispatched even further out to the twin probe Voyager 1, currently operating over 15 billion miles away, moving at a speed of over 38,000 miles per hour. This is the vanguard of human exploration, the greatest distance that any man-made object has ever traveled. We are coming up on the 50th anniversary of the Voyager mission launch, and hopes are high that the twin machines can live just long enough to see the milestone celebration. Optimistically, they should have power until at least 2030, and enough rocket fuel to continue pointing their antennas towards the Earth for another 10 to 15 years. But if these probes have already sailed past the edge of the solar system, then what are we keeping them turned on for? What is out there? This is where things get interesting. The interstellar mission of the Voyagers is our first investigation of space that is outside the influence of our own star, and by that we mean the area beyond the reach of the solar wind. We know that the sun is the energy source that powers our entire planetary system. Charged particles from the sun radiate out in all directions at over 1 million miles per hour. This is the solar wind, and while the sun is the engine that gives us life, the solar wind would also kill us all if the Earth's magnetic field wasn't creating a protective bubble that deflects the solar radiation. But there is a limit to the power of the sun. We call this region the termination shock. That's where the solar wind meets the interstellar wind. At this point, the solar wind slows abruptly from supersonic speed to subsonic. Beyond this slowdown point, the solar wind becomes more turbulent as it's compressed into a denser and hotter mass of atomic particles pressing up against interstellar space. This collision actually creates a protective bubble around the solar system known as the heliosheath. So just like the Earth's magnetic field protects our planet from the solar wind, the solar wind protects our entire planetary system from the cosmic ionizing radiation that permeates the galaxy. If we visualize the effect of that solar force field, we get the heliosphere which is the entire area of space influenced by the energy of the sun. Of course, it's not actually a sphere because the sun is not a stationary point. It is hurtling through space and taking us along with it. So the heliosphere is more like the wake of a ship moving through the ocean. This is why we launched Voyager 1 and 2 forwards in relation to the movement of the sun, also known as the solar apex, so that they would eventually get out ahead of the bow shock of the solar system and reach the undisturbed water, interstellar space. And this is where our two friends are located today. They may have only one half of the scientific instruments still functioning from when they left the Earth, but the Voyagers are still dutifully recording every bit of data that they can muster and sending their findings back home. Two relics from 1970s Earth floating on an expanse of cosmic ocean, riding the gravitational waves of exploding stars and supermassive black holes. 
let's talk about how they got there. This voyage did not begin by accident or inspiration, it was born of necessity, a fleeting opportunity to make an express trip through the outer solar system that will never come again in the lifetime of any human being currently on this Earth. What we are talking about is a rare geometric alignment of the outer planets that happens once about every 175 years, and in this particular arrangement, a spacecraft can swing from one planet to the next using the force of gravity as its main propulsion. The tricky thing about spaceflight is that everything is constantly in motion. The sun is orbiting around the center of the galaxy, and the planets are orbiting around the sun, so the motion of your spacecraft is relative to the motion of everything else in the solar system. That means to get from planet A to planet B, you need to change your velocity relative to planet A. If planet B is further away from the sun than planet A, then you need to increase your relative velocity. If planet B is closer to the sun, then you need to decrease your relative velocity. We call this change in velocity your delta V. Typically, in order to achieve delta V, you need propulsion. That means an engine and a fuel source. We know that there is a limit to the size of engine and fuel tank that we can include on a spacecraft because the amount of delta V required to get from the surface of the Earth and into space to begin requires an even bigger engine and fuel tank, and there is a limit to the size that we can build a rocket booster. So, if we look at the size of the Orion spacecraft relative to the size of the SLS rocket booster necessary to get that thing to orbital velocity, the difference is huge, and Orion is only going to the moon. That's a relatively small amount of delta V. Luckily for us, there is another way to achieve a massive change in velocity that doesn't involve burning rocket fuel. We can use a gravity assist. This is a tricky one, but in simple terms, by performing a close flyby of a gravitational body like a planet, you can impart some of the orbital momentum from the planet into your spacecraft. So imagine you're riding a skateboard down the road, and you decide to pull a Marty McFly and grab onto a passing truck. That's going to transfer kinetic energy from the truck to the skateboard. Same deal with a gravity assist, but instead of having to physically grab the planet, we take advantage of the gravitational pull to hijack that extra momentum. This is why we needed the alignment of the outer planets. The unique celestial event allowed the Voyager probe to link up gravity assist from the gas giants and continuously accelerate further and further out from the sun, all while using very minimal propulsion. The Voyagers essentially just use their engines and fuel to change their orientation, not their velocity. Unfortunately, the window for an express flight out of the solar system opened in the mid-70s, and it wasn't staying that way for very long. This was not a good time for human spaceflight, the exploratory spirit of Apollo had died with a whimper, the space shuttle program was struggling to get off the ground, and the United States economy was in the midst of a crippling energy shortage. So, the fact that Voyager even happened at all is a small miracle, but NASA was doing the best with what they had available, cannibalizing old hardware from Mariner and Apollo missions, they built Voyager 1 and 2 on a short timeline with an even shorter budget. The initial expectations for the mission were relatively low. NASA believed that the probes would last for just five years in deep space, long enough to explore the planetary systems of Jupiter and Saturn. Voyagers 1 and 2 are identical spacecraft, and each one is equipped with instruments to conduct 10 different experiments. Those include everything from television cameras to infrared and ultraviolet sensors, magnetometers, plasma detectors to cosmic ray and charged particle sensors. Even the spacecraft's radio is used to conduct experiments. The Voyagers have to travel too far from the sun to use solar panels, so instead they were equipped with power sources called radioisotope thermoelectric generators. These devices used on other deep space missions convert the heat produced from the natural radioactive decay of plutonium into electricity to power the spacecraft instruments, computers, radio, and other systems. The spacecraft are controlled and their data is returned through the Deep Space Network, which is a global system of antenna complexes located in California, Spain, and Australia. Voyager 1's trajectory, designed to send the spacecraft closely past the large moon Titan and behind Saturn's rings, 
bent the spacecraft's trajectory in a way that would send it flying north or up from the flat plane of the solar system, essentially slingshotting the probe straight out into the unknown. But Voyager 2 was aimed to fly by Saturn at a point that would automatically send the spacecraft in the direction of Uranus. If the hardware could manage to last long enough, it might have a chance of completing the grand tour of the solar system. Over the summer of 1977, Voyager 2 and then Voyager 1 were launched. All that NASA could do was hope for the best. And as we all know by now, that's exactly what they got. Both probes exceeded the best case scenario. Not only did they provide us with mind-blowing insight into the nature of Jupiter and Saturn, but thanks to continuous software updates over time that granted the Voyager's new capabilities, the mission was extended deeper into the outer planets. Voyager 1 would follow its original path to slingshot off of Saturn and head straight for the edge of the solar system. The probe broke away from the ecliptic plane of the Sun and angled up at 35 degrees. Voyager 2 continued straight into Uranus in 1986 and then leveraged the gravity assist to fly by Neptune in 89. Voyager 2 made its final slingshot maneuver to angle down from the plane of the solar system at 48 degrees and head south towards the edge. The information collected by Voyagers 1 and 2 essentially rewrote the book on planetary science. We'd been observing Jupiter through telescopes for hundreds of years, but only by seeing it up close did we start to realize the fundamental nature of the gas giant. This is how we found out that the red spot was an epic storm. We saw volcanoes erupt on the moon Io, found evidence of water under the crust of Europa, we flew through the rings of Saturn. As a kid growing up in the 90s, everything that we learned about the outer solar system came directly from Voyager 1 and 2. So these probes have obviously had a lot of cultural significance for us here on Earth, but they might also have some pretty massive implications for human culture outside of the Earth. You might know that each Voyager probe carries with it a 12-inch diameter gold-plated copper disc and contained on each disc is a legacy of the human race that could very well outlast the planet Earth. The beauty of the Voyager disc is that it is a true analog media, a phonograph record, so it doesn't require any specific technology to read that information. The stylus required to play back the record is included in the case, and the cover shows a simple pictogram of how the system works. In theory, anyone with an understanding of math and science as we know it should be able to figure it out based on the instructions given. One of the really cool things about a phonograph record is that you can code images into the surface the same as a cassette tape. So we have everything from pictures of the Earth and Moon to mathematical formulas, diagrams of the human anatomy, there are images of people, landscapes, buildings, and technology. Of course, the record contains music as well. There is classical work from Bach, Beethoven, and Mozart, rock and roll from Chuck Berry, jazz by Louis Armstrong, and traditional music from cultures all over the world. The record has sounds recorded from natural events like thunder and volcanoes, animal records to the sounds of engines in everything from a tractor to a jet aircraft. And then finally, it has greetings from the people of Earth spoken in 55 different languages. There's also a pulsar map engraved into the record cover to show where the probe came from and a spot of pure uranium to function as a radioactive clock. By measuring the decay of the uranium, the finder should be able to calculate the elapsed time since the record was created. There are three possible scenarios for these records. In one, a future human society, far more advanced in science and technology than we can possibly imagine, will go out and retrieve the Voyager probe. This could be hundreds of years later, but it also could be thousands of years from now. Imagine a curated time capsule left behind by an ancient civilization. Time can be scary. Scenario number two is that a totally alien race finds one of these probes adrift in interstellar space, as far as we know, science and math should be consistent across all of the stars and galaxies of the universe, and assuming that they have eyes and ears of some kind or another, then any alien species capable of finding the Voyager should be able to receive our message. 
In about 40,000 years, Voyager 1 will drift within 1.6 light years of a star we call AC plus 793888. At the same time, Voyager 2 will pass 1.7 light years from the star Ross 248, and in about 296,000 years, it will pass 4.3 light years from Sirius, the brightest star in the sky. Then we reach scenario number three, where the Voyagers and their gold records simply continue to drift through interstellar space for millions or even billions of years until they finally reach an end, whatever that might be. They smash into a planet, they get wiped away by a supernova, they fall into the singularity of a black hole, maybe they simply erode away into space dust. The universe is unpredictable, but for now, we can maybe take a little comfort in the knowledge that somewhere out there is proof that humans on Earth can accomplish amazing things.